Heavenly Father, Lord God. We praise your holy name, Lord God. And we lift your holy name on high, Lord God. Blessed be your name, O Lord. Blessed be your name. Father God, in the midst of this craziness that's going all around us, There's so much uncertainty in a world when people are panicking, buying up things. They're uncertain. Father God, but you are the calm in the storm. As we come to your house of worship, Lord, give us rest. Speak to our spirit. Let us know everything's going to be okay. For you are in control. For you are the almighty God, creator of the universe. Nothing is too small, too great for you, Lord. I pray your peace be upon us, Lord. I pray a hedge of protection over the families, those who are here and those who are not, Lord. Lord, give us the confidence and the assurance that everything is going to be okay. Fill us with your spirit. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we stand, we lift up God's name all together, those are online as well. Let's uh, lift up our name of Lord Jesus Christ. In Psalm 121, we said, where I look up, I look up to the hills. Where does my health come from? My health comes from the Lord who has created the heaven and earth. We lift up his wonderful name. <laughs> Yeah. 
to lift up his name. God, you're so good. Many times we don't understand, but you know, God is good. All things will work out for those who call upon his name, those who love him. God will be guiding us in every step, and he will be protecting us in all ways. God, you are so good. Let us sing this uh, wonderful prayer. You're so good. 
place father god as we worship your name we lift up your name in spirit and in truth oh god no matter where we are father god father protect us we love you in jesus name we pray amen um as you know, that uh, there will be no fellowship, no snacks after this worship service. So after the worship service, um, we will be dismissed. And um, starting uh, 322, 329, uh, we'll, this service will be online on YouTube. So if you need the URL, just reach out to uh, one of the Pastor Rob or one of the deacons, and we'll get that information to you. We're still doing our three-year Bible reading. Um, we are on Exodus 21, so I, I pray that you'll continually and faithfully uh, follow with us. As a church body, it is important that we read the Word of God. Uh, we'll be doing the tithes and offering. So that will be done on the back of that. So um, when you are, when you get dismissed, we'll be doing that. Let us all rise for the reading of God's word. Matthew fourteen nineteen. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. Amen. Okay, all right, sounds good. So welcome uh, to Agape's English service. Uh, we'll be having one service uh, for the time being, and we'll see how long that proceeds. The elders have decided uh, that it's...
today, and then we'll continue on to the remainder of March, and we'll see what happens uh, after that. Um, we are in the, a series currently on prayer, who, what, when, where, why, and so today we're going to be covering up uh, where, but last week we talked about uh, when we should pray, and we talked about some emotions in which we should pray, like when we're happy or joyous or angry, and this was one of the questions that came up, right? If God wants me to joyous, why am I suffering? And people asked me uh, this question, right? if God wants me to be joyous, you know, why am I going through these trials? Why is my life difficult? And it's a great question to ask, right? How come when we, uh, you know, God commands that we be uh, joyous, which is different than happiness, right? Happiness is based on happenings or circumstances. Uh, joy is far more than that, far greater than this simple aspect of an emotion, a uh, feeling, if you will, right? We find joy, contentment in Christ, so joy uh, versus suffering, why do we have those? And so in Scripture, Romans 5, it tells us that these sufferings produce perseverance, and perseverance character and character hope, that these trials in our life eventually should draw us near to, to God. Right? But even in that first section, that these sufferings produce perseverance, we can apply that to the secular world. It seems valuable, this aspect of endurance, uh, whether it's at our work or in our relationships or our marriages or this church, that as we face struggles, that we can persevere through them. Now, as believers, uh, there are some interesting aspects of that. As you face troubles, difficulty, circumstances, are you going to run away from God, right? Or are you going to run to God? Are you going to blame God for the circumstances, difficulties in your life, or are you going to beg God for help? And you can choose whichever way uh, you want to go. You have the free will to do so. Now, C.S. Lewis answers this question in an interesting way. If we found ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we are made for another world. That if there's this, like, odd ache, this God-sized hole, this hole in your life that you can't fill, that is seemingly out of place, then maybe we weren't made for this one, and we were made for another one. Now, as we know, uh, life is pretty short. Uh, for this congregation, we're older. For those watching, you may be younger. Life is pretty short. The average lifespan is, what, less than 80 years on average. Of course, some of us will be blessed with longer ones and some shorter. But in that brief life, right, some people call it an illusion. It's just a blowing of the wind in terms of eternity. Right? And if we relate that to, say, a movie trailer, um, we watched a movie yesterday for my daughter's birthday. Uh, she wanted to see uh, Men in Black, I think it's like four or five, and so all these teenage uh, kids were in my house watching this movie. Right? And there are trailers in the beginning, uh, and they're pretty brief and short. And if that is our life, in those moments, there can be sadness, uh, happiness, anger, joy. There can be these brief moments, but the masterpiece, uh, eternity, right? Whether you face sufferings and trials in this life, it doesn't mean that this masterpiece that God has created right, is unfair, is out of place. It gives us just this brief glimpse into God's uh, plan. Now, where should we pray? Well, interesting. Where should we pray? Oftentimes we pray in church. Now, for those watching, you're going to be praying at home, but people come to the church to pray, which is valid, though interesting. In the Old Testament, people would go to the tabernacle or the temple to pray. And sometimes people say, well, you know, I go to church to pray. Or people only pray in church, which may be once a week or once a month or once a year. I, I don't know uh, where your faith lies. And so this time may be interesting. For those watching, at least, we may be praying in our homes. Maybe that will encourage you to pray more regularly instead of just when you go to uh, church. Right? Because in the Old Testament, uh, you find that God calls them out of their camp to Mount Sinai right, to encounter him. And in the New Testament, right, Jesus tells us that we're given this comforter, the Holy Spirit. And so you have God with you all the time. You don't have to wait 
for a specific location. You don't have to come to this particular church or another church or some place to pray. Though there may be benefits to going to a specific location uh, to pray, we can discuss some of those places. Jesus tells us he often withdrew to lonely places and prayed, right? Scripture tells us that he did that. And he tells his disciples not to pray publicly in the streets so that way you can be acknowledged as the Pharisees did. Right? Market days were, say, Monday, Thursday, and the Pharisees would go out and fast and pray so people could see their holiness. And Jesus says, don't do that. Pray in private places. And that's what he did. But he also prayed in public. And we read that in our scripture reading. He directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves, two fish, looking up to them, and he gave thanks, broke the breads, and he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. Right? So he prayed in public as well, and he gave his disciples right, that example to follow. And so for us, hopefully, we pray in both those locations, in private, but also in public places. Now, this is uh, the trailhead for Yosemite. You can see the start of it, uh, the Nature Center, and it winds all the way to the footbridge, if those of you are familiar with Yosemite, and on to Vernal Falls, and those more adventurous were probably Nevada, and then further on, right, to Half Dome. And we used to take individuals and students on these trips. And my family would go once a year uh, to go to Yosemite. And oftentimes, when I'm walking through this trailhead, Right? When you're alone and isolated and you experience God's presence, you see his glory, his creation, there have been times when I would praise God, when I would talk to God in them. So I'm walking on these switchbacks, right, back and forth, and I'm singing as loud as I can. I don't remember what I was singing, like, God is so good, maybe, or I don't know what I was singing, but I was singing loudly in awe of his creation. And then I turn a corner, and there was just a whole bunch of people. I was like, and so I stopped right? Because it was odd or awkward or it felt weird that I had just been like singing on the top of my voice, praising God for his creation, and then all of a sudden there was just random people. And so I stopped. I waited till they passed. And I can't quite remember if I started again after that embarrassing moment. But hopefully we pray uh, outside of these set places in our mind, whether you have to go to church or you have to be here to pray. You can pray anywhere at all times, at Yosemite or, or not. Jesus is far more concerned about the spiritual location of our hearts than the geographical location of our bodies. Oftentimes, the debates in churches, how should one dress? Should they dress really well, not well? Some people say, uh, you know, there's a Sunday dress where people are really dressed up. Other people dress super casual. Really, it's the matter of your heart. Right? It's the matter of your heart, which no one else can see but you. And you know what you give to God, and you know how you come before God, only you. My suggestion is set a place, a time to pray. Uh, build the habit into your life. Uh, in the movie War Room, this lady has a place to pray. She has a space in her house devoted to spending time with God. And she does that with scripture and prayer, and she has all these notes. And so in Building 100, you find that there is a prayer wall of all these requests that people have made. And there's a prayer and answered section on another wall of how God has been good to us, how God has answered our prayer. So definitely a good way for you to build the habit of praying. Um, a set location if possible, but maybe a set time. Not when I go to church, but maybe every day at 8 o'clock. Maybe every day before I do my homework, I'll spend time reading my Bible, doing devotions. Maybe right, this will help us build a habit of prayer into our life, which is what we hope for. Right? Be consistent as we go before God. In these quiet places, hopefully, we can drown out the world. We can put aside our phone and put aside our distractions and just focus on God for a moment. And all the stress and anxiety we have in our life, we can bring it to God. Ah, at the dining table. For you parents and adults, I 
You pray for one another. Uh, you pray for the church. You pray for the future with all the uncertainty that's happening now. Uh, you pray. And you set that example for your family and your children. And so if you are not doing that, my recommendation is to start. And today is a good day as any. And so if you're not praying for meals, uh, please do so. Now, if your prayer for meals is extremely brief and short, which is totally okay, uh, you know, God, thank you for the food, amen, totally fine. Um, maybe at times uh, you can pour out your heart before God and set the example for your spouse or your children uh, or whomever is there at the time. And so please strive to pray uh, at the dining table. Now, this is often what I look like. I'm not that old yet, but I try to pray and do my devotions and read scripture in the morning. Um, so I'll have breakfast, usually just a small bowl of cereal, uh, and then I will read the chapter for the day, which takes me two minutes maybe. Uh, pretty brief, right? Because it's only one chapter, and it's only going to, you know, it's going to take us three years to get through it. It's not like we're doing three or four chapters and taking us one year. So building good habits into your life where you are uh, placing God all around you, which is why we give you things like the daily bread to place in your homes, in your restroom, and wherever, so that way you can crack open God's word wherever you are. Right. People play in public places. This is a fireman praying for a meal. And you can do that too. Now, for some of us, that's embarrassing and shameful. Others find it easy and doesn't matter which uh, level you're at or where you are. But the encouragement is that you pray in public places too. Um, now, if you are praying in public places, another step, if you will, which is a very difficult one, but I will uh, tell you what we have done in the past uh, with people, is when the waiter or waitress comes up, you might say something like, we're about to pray. Is there something we can pray for you about? We've had some interesting dialogue with people in the service industry regarding their life. Sometimes people have no idea what you're saying. They freak out and they leave, which is fine. Other times, people share their struggles with you. You're Christ to them. You're their counselor. You're able to share their life and emotion and struggles and pray with them. And I think that's amazing, amazing. Hospitals, oh, right. So... Uh, I've been working with adults now for four months, I guess full-time, if you will. We have a, adults on our staff. We've been working with them for you know, a couple decades. But as far as full-time adult ministry, I've spent more time in hospitals in the last four months than I have in the four years we've been here, which is pretty interesting for me. Right? I don't, I'm not normally in the hospital, nor do I like going to the doctor to check up personally, which is probably a bad thing. But hospitals, we pray there a lot because people are ill. Whether you're a believer or not, when there's struggle in your life, people turn to God and they pray. Psalm 6, I am worn out from my groaning. All night long I flood my bed with weeping and I drench my couch with tears. This is David, right? Just ugly crying before God, pouring his heart out before God, struggling before God. The ESV says, I'm weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping Now, in our life, our youngest daughter has a friend who has Crohn's disease. Um, I'm not altogether too familiar with it, but when she eats, it's painful, so she doesn't eat. And so she loses quite a bit of weight, and so she's half my daughter's size. Uh, and my daughter, at seven years old, is pretty big, but um, she's a tiny young lady, and yet she's happy and exuberant in how she approaches life, which is to be admired. Recently, she got an ND tube. Um, it goes you know, through your nose, down to your stomach, and she's fed through that. And there's a machine, and they dole out a specific amount for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It takes a specific amount of time, and they connect it, and she has to do that every single day. And so when the doctors recommended that she have this tube placed in her nose so that way it's visible for the world to see, she was said, no, mom, it's okay, no problem, I can do that. Such an amazing young individual to face some difficult circumstances, and she finds that it to be okay, that she's, um, one would argue, joyous. Like, no matter the circumstances in her life, she's upbeat, and that's difficult to find. To find that in a little seven-year-old girl for me was was inspiring. 
Uh, this is not the young lady, but you can see an example of what it would look like. They have a tube and it's uh, attached to their cheek and goes down. Uh, so it's out of sight while they're in school or wherever they may be, but a difficult life. The Japanese people consider crying good for us, so much so that they've created something called, I don't know, ryukatsu, which sounds like, uh, anyways, uh, which means tear-seeking. Members of these crying clubs come together to watch sad movies and have a good ball, all with the goal of staying balanced and mentally healthy. Now, oftentimes in, I'm not sure if it's all male culture, but in this male culture, we view crying as bad, right? That you shouldn't show emotion, you shouldn't cry which is interesting, not one that I particularly hold to, as my wife can attest, or my students can attest to, but there are reasons for our tears, right? There are good aspects to them, uh, basal tears. Constantly secrete these protein-rich antibacterial tears, moisten our eyes when we blink. We have reflex tears. Uh, these tears are prompted by things like smoke, wind, strong smells, uh, you know, like when you have onions. They flush out irritants, protect the eye. You have emotional tears, right? which contain a higher level of stress hormones, trickled by our feelings, our reactions. Um, and these emotional tears do things like self-soothe. Right? They contain a higher amount of manganese, potassium, hormones such as prolactin. Uh, emotional tears dull pain. Lengthy cry reduce, uh, releases oxytocin and endorphins, which relieve physical and emotional stress. I mean, there's all these reasons why it's good to be emotional and cry. Right? It reduces stress. Right? by allowing stress hormones like cortisol to leave the body and improves mood, enhances communication because people know that there's something that you're struggling with or something difficult in your life. A person produces 10 ounces of tears a day. I'm assuming that's an average. I don't have the research on that. It's roughly 30 gallons a year. That's a lot of tears. Well, I had a stable job and a beautiful no home, but my days were so very empty. I felt alone. Every day seemed the same. I'd go downstairs to work, and then I'd eat on the second floor, and then I would go back upstairs to sleep. I didn't have a husband or children, and there were no friends in my life. Though I was married once, we were both unfaithful. And I discovered I couldn't have children. But I really wanted to make something of my life. He wasn't supportive, so I had to get out. I believed the lies about myself, that I was worthless and unwanted. I tried to fight back from my depression medication, new therapy, new relationships, but nothing worked. I talked to my sister, but I never wanted to tell her about the dark places that I had gone. I kept hearing this chatter in my head, this voice that sounded like me, but it wasn't. It said you were worthless. Nobody wants you. You don't even have any friends. I thought, I might have 30 years of life ahead of me. And that felt like a prison sentence. That's when I started thinking about suicide. And I came up with a plan. I was relieved to think that it would be over soon. My sister knew I was in danger, but she didn't know how to help. So she started reading parts of Dr. Stanley's book, When the Enemy Strikes. I heard her voice, but I didn't listen to what she was saying. The chatter in my head was so overwhelming. One day, my sister read a list of statements from the book. They were lies Satan uses to deceive us. And something in my mind clicked and I yelled, what are you saying? How do you know what I'm hearing in my head? My sister sent me the book and I poured over the pages. I felt like Jesus was saying, Debbie, just give me your sin. 
giving your pain one detail at a time. God opened my eyes to what was happening in my life and how he was going to rescue me. The funny thing is, nothing around me has changed. I still wake up. I get ready. The only thing that has changed is me. I used to be so scared. I felt like depression would consume me. But now, I don't dread the rest of my life. I'm excited for God to use me. I might only have 30 years. Now my prayer is, Lord, we've got a lot to do together. So let's get going. Personally, I'm looking for those people to do ministry with. The people that pray to God, Lord, we got a lot to do, so let's get going. Um, those are the people I want to do ministry with personally. Um, not that they have to be completely broken, though brokenness before God definitely helps with your humility. Um, I want people uh, to work with us that understand there's so much work to do in this brevity of life that as people view your life, what you say and what you do, that it can affect their eternity. And we only get a very short slice, a very short time for us maybe to affect uh, their eternity. Now, oftentimes people pray in bed um, when in, they're going to sleep, and that's good and bad, right? It's great that we start and end our day with God. Oftentimes we may start our prayer, Dear Heavenly Father, and then pass out, which uh, happens to us, I'm sure. But if you struggle with those things mentioned, uh, loneliness, depression, suicide, uh, reach, out, reach out for help to myself or the staff, those around you, those at this church, your small groups, your community groups, your friends, because you need help. And hopefully the church globally, as well as this local one, can uh, walk with you through that. Right? There are counselors here that can do that uh, as well. Work school, as you're at work, as you're going to work, as you're traveling from work, um, many of us listen to music or podcasts, and so my suggestion is that instead of listening to whatever secular thing you're listening to, which is fine, I oftentimes listening, I listen to car stuff, right, uh, racing things, how to get faster, uh, what type of vehicles, uh, things of that nature. Also add God to your life, whether it's through uh, Caleb, which you can find on your phone as an app, or also, uh, obviously, on the radio. In our local area, it's 107.3, I believe. Um, listen to podcasts. And we'll send this out uh, by email, or maybe we can put it in the show notes for someone that's upstairs. Um, there are many different Christian podcasts, many excellent Christian podcasts, a wide range of subjects uh, uh, that we can discuss. Right? Add God uh, to your life. Now, we're going to conclude today with this model, uh, ACTS. Uh, it's an easy model for us to remember. People have asked, well, how do I pray? This is a very brief, a very easy to remember, very short model uh, that we can add to our life to help us uh, pray. Now, A stands for adoration, that the paying honor as to a divine being, worship, right? We can praise God, right? We start there because the Bible is not about you. The Bible is about God, right? So confession, normal acknowledgement, admission of guilt. We went through that, I think, two uh, Sundays ago. We spent some time in confession before God. We asked you to be specific regarding your sins before God, to acknowledge them. Most of us never do that. And then Thanksgiving, this is... Probably a pretty easy aspect for many of us, right? Thank God for your family, your friends, your work, uh, your situation in life, uh, etc. And then supplication, the act or instance of humble prayer, entreaty, or petition. So this is at the very end, you ask God for things, which is oftentimes the only thing we do in prayer. But at the very end of our prayer, we end with supplication, and then even we like to divide up into two aspects. The first one is for others. So we want you at the very end of your prayer to consider, think of others, those around you, and there are many, right? Uh, oftentimes you can spend a significant time just praying for your family, and not just your wife and your kids, but your extended family. Um, 
and then maybe you can expand that to your church. And there are many here, and almost all of us have issues that we're dealing with. Then, of course, at the very end, as we divided supplication into two aspects, for yourself. Because that's the easiest part. That's what prayer consists of for most of us. Just a list of things we want God to do in our life. And so as Esther comes and play, uh, plays piano, we are going to partake and practice uh, prayer. For those at home, uh, please do so as well. That may be awkward or interesting or odd for you. We live in interesting times. So let us uh, pray. to be oh. 
Let us pray. Uh, Dear Holy Father, you are uh, beyond measure, beyond our understanding. As creator of the universe and creator of us, uh, help us to acknowledge you and bow down before you. I ask that you help us to confess our sins, to spend time in reflection. Uh, Help me with my own issues that I face, uh, whether it be anger or pride or lust. Uh, May we learn uh, to bow down before you. Uh, We thank you, Lord, for all that you do for this service and this church. Uh, for our life and our children, our circumstances, our careers. Uh, We thank you uh, for all that we have. We ask that you watch over those that are suffering or in pain, whether with health or the struggles and trials that they face. Uh, May they learn to run to you and find you and experience your peace and joy and contentment in their life. We pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand as we read. Oh. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you. Oh, I passed over the song. Sorry, I tried to control it here. I apologize.